All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity eighteen years, and was bowed together, and could in no wise lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him, and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day, and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work. In them, therefore, come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, Doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to watering? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan had bound, lo, these eighteen years, he loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? That's the thirteenth chapter of Luke, tenth to the sixteenth verse. And these cassettes are also in book form, how to use your healing power, the meaning of the healings in the New Testament. They're based upon a class I gave uh, last year, 1975, where we discussed the miraculous healings recorded in the New Testament and explained how the same principles and methods can be applied by every individual who could be yourself to correct any discordant physical or mental or financial condition. You can also use it it's written in simple language, ex explains how you can help yourself, how you can use these great truths, which, have, uh, which are eternal, really, for the truth is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The healing power didn't start a couple of thousand years ago. The healing power was never born, will never die, because the healing power is the God presence, and God was never born and will never die. Healings go on all the time. You know the healings taking place in England by the laying on of hands, by Harry Edwards, many others. These things have gone on since as far back as we can go. Healing by the laying on of hands has gone on for countless generations. It's practiced in the Roman Catholic Church, Episcopal Church, practiced by spirit, uh, spiritualists and many, many others. I've seen some remarkable healings performed in that manner. Some say they are gifted and their hands are healing hands. Of course, if they believe that they have this divine gift of healing, it is done unto them as they believe. But everybody in the world has the gift of healing, for the infinite healing presence is within you. God indwells you. You may not be using it, but it's there. The truth of the matter is that all of us have that gift of healing. That's why you stir up the gift of God within you. It is not a divine prerogative bestowed on the few, because God indwells all men. I am God, and there is no God beside me. I said, ye are gods, and all of you are sons of the Most High. The healing presence is operating within you 24 hours a day. Did you ever consider all the cuts, bruises, and scratches you experienced when young? Did you notice an infinite intelligence at work? It formed thrombin in the cut, closed it up, gave you new cells, formed a little bridge there, and the intelligence within you created new skin and new tissue, and the complete healing took place. You had hundreds and hundreds of healings since you were born. This happened in all probability without your being aware of it. The intelligence within is constantly renewing your body. Faith causes this healing power to speed up tremendously, so much so that you can experience an instantaneous healing through expectancy and faith and belief. As a matter of fact, a great number of churches of all denomination, denominations practice the laying on of hands. We are told the woman in the Bible story was healed on the Sabbath day. Many practice the Sabbath from a literal standpoint, thinking it is a sin to drive a nail on the Sabbath or do the work of any kind. All this, of course, is absurd. Some go to extremes and won't even handle money on the Sabbath. All this is absolutely meaningless. 
The Sabbath is an inner stillness, an inner certitude, whereby man reminds himself of the availability of the God presence in all emergencies, at all times, everywhere. It means to rest in God. The Sabbath is that inner conviction, that inner certitude of yours that your prayer is answered. It's the interval of time between the impregnation and its manifestation or objectification. And then you are in the Sabbath, you have no further desire to pray about it. It's the inner silent knowing of the soul. You're walking in the Sabbath when you accept in your mind that your prayer is answered. When you meditate and pray and succeed in reaching the point of inner peace, then your prayer is answered. You have reached the seventh day, the seventh hour, which psycholo psychologically means the moment of conviction. That's why at the seventh hour he was healed. It's not the seventh hour of the day. It has nothing to do with time. It's the point of mental acceptance and conviction within you. That's the seventh hour. Your inner conviction, that inner certitude, that silent knowing of the soul. You're in the Sabbath when your heart is aflame with the glory of the infinite and the certainty certainty of his response. And at that moment, you will experience an instantaneous divine transfusion of energy, power, vitality, and life. We must realize that external acts, ritual ceremonies, and conforming to rites, precepts, and ordinances of some organization or church is not real religion or true worship. A man may observe all the rules and regulations of his church and at the same time violate all the laws of God in his heart. He could go to church every day of the week and yet be very unreligious. We must become aware of the fact that the only change that matters is the internal change, the change of the heart. Where you have actually fallen in love with spiritual values. For religion is of the heart, not of the lips. Your religion is what you do, it's your life, is based upon your actions, is based upon your relationship with people. For the word religion means reback and ligio I bind. Are you bound to love, to peace, to harmony, to joy? Are you bound to the source of all life which is gone? Are you bound by the conviction that, that you uh, honor the infinite in the land of the living and that you believe in the goodness of God in the land of the living, the joy of the Lord, which is your strength, and that the will of the infinite for you is a greater measure of life, love, truth, and beauty, something transcending your fondest dreams? If you have that kind of belief or conviction, you have a wonderful religion. Because when you have fallen in love, which means an emotional attachment to spiritual values, then all fear, enemies, and sickness will fall away. When you walk in the consciousness of peace, health, happiness, and goodwill, you are in the Sabbath all day long. You are in the Sabbath when you feel and know that it is impossible for your prayer to fail. You are an unmoved, undisturbed, calm, serene, and tranquil because you are carrying in your subjective mind a divine impression, a subconscious embodiment of your ideal. You know that there is always an interval of time between the subjective embodiment and the objective manifestation. Your inner certitude and imperturbability is the Sabbath. And it was on the Sabbath day that she was healed. The ruler of the synagogue mentioned in the Bible means the ruling thought or prevailing worldly viewpoint or opinion. It means the dominant idea in your mind. Uh, I have a cassette, by the way, The Wonders of the Master Thought. You ought to listen to it. It tells you all about this ruling thought in your mind and what it does to you. The ruling belief, that conviction. The synagogue is your mind where the aggregation of thoughts, feelings, moods, and opinions gather. Jesus is always available, which means that you're looking at your desire, you are really looking at Jesus, or your solution, biblically speaking, or that which saves. Because if you were in prison, freedom would be your savior. 
If you were very sick, health would be your saviour. If you were lost in the jungle, the guiding principle within you would lead you out, for there is no man to lead you out. There is no man to save you. And uh, if you're um, hungry, food is your saviour. Like the people now in Guatemala, well, American planes, and of course doctors and nurses, food and all these things are going there. They're lost out there in the jungle, and uh, these helicopters will bring them food and water and things they need. And of course that saves their lives, and they probably get an injection too for prevent fevers and things of that nature. The woman who has the infirmity means the feeling of weakness, the depressed state of consciousness, the subjective belief in some crippling disease. The word woman means emotional nature, the subjective side of life. Whatever our disease, it represents a negative pattern of thought charged with emotion in our subliminal depths. The ruler of the synagogue represents the fear thoughts, the doubts and arguments which come to your mind, trying to dissuade you to turn away from the belief in the one power which can do all things. There is an argument in your mind, and you must psychologically slay these hypocritical thoughts by asking them where they came from. Where does fear come from? It's a thought in your own mind. Does it belong there? Is there a principle behind it? Is it just a shadow in your mind? Is there a principle behind these thoughts you have? Are they not shadows? The fear thoughts have no heavenly credentials. Say, where do they come from? What is the source? Are they true? Did you ever sit down and ask yourself the things you believe? Where do they come from? Are they real? Are they true? Are they illogical, unreasonable, unscientific? Do they insult the intelligence of a ten-year-old boy who's studying a little chemistry or physics? So find out the origin of them and say, will not believe anything that does not conform to the eternal truth. For truth never changes. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It has no label. You can't put any label on truth. For God is truth. I am the truth. I am the way. I am the life. Your own God within you is the truth. Always the same yesterday, today, and forever. Truth doesn't change. Take your attention away from the false beliefs of the world, and they die of neglect. Feast and God's almighty power. Accept it. Imagine that you are being healed now. Do this as often as necessary, and you will experience the Sabbath, or the fullness of acceptance. Then you will rise and walk through the power of the Almighty, because you pictured yourself walking, doing all the things you would do. You know the spirit can't be paralyzed. And then you say, through the power of the Almighty, I'll, I'll walk, for God walks and talks in me. It is then the Sabbath day for you. Dr. Fleet, a psychologist at London University, who used to arrange lectures for me, she's now retired, used to lecture, arrange lectures for me in Caxton Hall in London, regularly and systematically. I founded the Truth Forum over there many years ago. It's still functioning. And she told me that during the air raids in London, during the war, uh, she was helping people. She was on the streets. And uh, a bomb hit a hospital where some people had been paralyzed. She said for 18, 20 years, couldn't move. They ran down the stairs and out into the street. And some of them, she said, are still walking. Others said, oh, look, I'm paralyzed. I shouldn't be walking. And, of course, they went right back to their paralytic state. This shows you that in time of emergency... They heard that the bomb was hitting the hospital, you know, and they ran. Why the idea? Uh, the idea to save their lives, seize their mind. They forgot that they were paralyzed. The Spirit of the Almighty began to move on their behalf. And most of them, she said, accepted the healing and are still walking. So that power is within you, and you don't have to wait for a bomb to hit the hospital, you know, to get up and walk as many have discovered. And it came to pass, as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day, 
that they watched him. And behold, there was a man, certain man, before him, which had the dropsy. And Jesus answering, speak unto the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And they held their peace, and he took him, and healed him, and let him go. And answered them, saying, Which of you shall have a donkey or an ox fallen into the pit, and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him again to these things. 14 chapter of Luke, 1 to the 6th verse. These are based upon the healing powers of the New Testament. It's uh, how to use your healing power. There's a book on it based upon a class that I gave in 1975, the most popular of all classes. If you'd like to read it, it's also in book form as well as cassettes. There are four cassettes, number one, two, three, and four. Also in book form called How to Use Your Healing Power. And some of you I know might like to read, uh, read these things as well as hear them. Now the Pharisee, of course, is everywhere. It isn't the man who lived a couple of thousand years ago. That's utter nonsense. He's in every city and town all over the world. He's the type of man who lays stress on external acts and observances. He adheres to the letter of the law and lacks the love and understanding behind the words of the gospel. The Pharisee believes that the fan gives him a stiff neck, that germs are the cause of his cold, that the hidden virus is the cause of his influenza. Uh, he adheres to the letter of the law and lacks the spirit which giveth life. External rituals, yes, and pomp and ceremony and all these things, yes, and he belongs, you know, to what you call the right church, and it's too bad you don't. And all this, uh, because all this other, I call it nonsense, because the church is within you. Ecclesia, meaning you draw out the wisdom and the power and the intelligence of God that is within you. Your life is your religion. What do you do? How do you express? You're expressing more and more of God, of love, light, truth, and beauty every day. Uh, do we see your religion made manifest in your home, in your business, relationship with people, in your body, in your writings, in your art, in your science, in all phases of your life? The weather, conditions, and circumstance influence the mind in a suggestive way only. Man is the only thinker in his world. Therefore it follows that the fan can't give him a cold except he thinks it does. There are people who work under a fan all day long. They don't get a stiff neck. Or they don't get a cold either. A belief is a thought in the mind generally accepted as true. Uh, so, as I mentioned, many people can sit under a fan all day long, rejoicing in it, without getting a cold, or influenza, or a stiff neck. If one accepts the hypnotic suggestion that he will catch cold because of a draft, the fact still remains that the cold was due to his own thought. He had the power to reject or accept the suggestion. If accepted, the result is due to the movement of his own mind. He has no one to blame but himself. His mind accepted a false idea and produced the consequences. The case of dropsy mentioned in the above gospel story was due to a flood of negativity. When the mind is full of strain, stress and tension, a corresponding effect is produced in the body and there is a breakdown in the organs of elimination. If a man is possessed with hatred or deep-seated resentment, it could well bring on an internal flood, which, if not checked, could terminate in disintegration of his vital organs due to the corrosive effect of these mental poisons. The conditions in the body are all picturings of man's mental attitude or states of consciousness. I remember reading, some years ago now, an article by Dr. Alvarez of the Mayo Clinic. And he said a man came into the hospital suffering from internal drowning, dropsy, in other words. And in talking to him, he said, this is the essence of it. I am quoting it from memory. This is the essence of it. He said that uh, in talking to him, he realized that he needed a chaplain. 
because the man hated his sister so much. It was over a lawsuit, over a will or something of that nature. And he said, I will not forgive her. I'll hate her and I'll keep on hating. Well, he said that the Mayo Clinic, he said we couldn't do anything for him because he was suffering from this internal drowning of hatred. And he really had drops in accumulation. He refused to forgive. Uh, but you're told, you know, forgive and it'll 70 times 7. There's also the flood, you know, of God's ideas, which the poet gets at times, or the musician get, gets. It's a flood of God's ideas, which flood the mind, you know. You get into a sort of an ecstasy or a rapture, you hear the celestial music. So that flood is a real thing, you know. I knew a man in London who was very religious and completely free from any ill will or resentment. However, he saw his father die of dropsy, it made a very deep impression on him. He told me that all his life he feared that the same thing would happen to him. You know that story, don't you? That which I greatly feared has come upon me. He added that his fa father used to be tapped with an instrument that the doctor would draw out large amounts of water from the abdominal area. It was called tapping. This lingering fear which was never neutralized, was undoubtedly the cause of his dropsical condition. He did not know the simple psychological truth, which Quinby elucidated about a hundred years ago. He said that if you believe something, it will manifest whether you're consciously thinking of it or not. This man's fear became a belief that he would become a victim of the same disorder that troubled his father. This explanation helped the man considerably. He began to realize that he, accept, he had accepted a liar's troop. He was receiving some salargan, which uh, helped him, of course, immeasurably in eliminating the excess flow of water. The truth began to dawn upon him, that his fear was a perversion of the truth, a fear which had no real power, because there is no principle behind the discord. There is a principle of health, none of disease, a principle of abundance, none of poverty, a principle of honesty, none of deceit. A principle of mathematics, none of error. A principle of beauty, none of ugliness. His belief was the only power which controlled him. One's mind can be moved negatively or positively, and can be influenced by good or evil. This man saw the truth about his situation and cast out the lie. He cooperated with his doctors, but he also reasoned that the healing power which made him was still with him, that his disease was due to a disordered group of thoughts. Thus he rearranged his mind to conform to the divine pattern. Before going to sleep at night, he would affirm with feeling and with a deep meaning behind each word, the healing presence is now going to work transforming, healing, restoring, and controlling all processes of my body according to divine wisdom and divine love. I rest secure in this knowledge. I know it is God in action, which is all around harmony and peace. There is no other power, and this healing power is working now. He repeated this prayer every night for about 30 days, knowingly, feelingly, and with deep understanding. At the end of that time, his mind had reached a conviction of wholeness or health. This was the Sabbath day for him, which meant the moment of complete fulfillment in his mind. You can take the Sabbath literally and uh, observe, you know, Sunday or Saturday, whatever it might be, it's Friday in some parts of the world, and, uh, you know, your life can be a mess too. So it is nothing, you don't take these things literally, take it literally, it means absolutely nothing. I attended a church service some years ago during which the minister gave a very fine talk on divine healing. After the service, a member of the church board said to him, it's all right to say Jesus healed, but don't say we can do it. Can you imagine a statement like that in this so-called enlightening age? Look at the hospitals in the world, the insane people who are being healed, the cripples who walk and the epileptics who are restored, and the laying on of hands that goes on, and the spiritual healing in the Philippines and in England and many parts of the world. People being healed at shrines, and they get up and walk, and you read in your daily newspaper, oh, the inquire and many other articles of cancer being completely healed when it has metastasized, when it has even gone into the brain, 
Look at the work Dr. Simonton is doing, uh, formerly of Travis Air Base, on his work on cancer, taking hopeless cases and healing them. So these things are going on, and they have gone on. And many of these things, Quinby duplicated mo most of the, not all, but um, I'd say 60% of all the so-called medicals in the New Testament. He said if he lived long enough, he would be able to accomplish and duplicate all of them. Can you imagine a statement, therefore, like, like that today? The man who said that had hundreds of healings himself all through his life. Life is forever healing our cuts and bruises, sprains and scratches. It never condemns us when we take some contaminated food. The same life principle which seeks to preserve us, causes us to regurgitate, and tries its utmost to heal us. The tendency of all life is to heal, to restore. A healing will take place if, as Emerson says, we take our bloated nothingness out of the way. Christian scientist told me one time uh, that he swallowed a poisonous liquid by mistake. He was a splendid practitioner, had great faith in the God power. He told me that he was a hundred miles away from any kind of help, so that he had to rely solely on the subjective power and wisdom within. He said that he got very still, and these are the words he used. God is in his holy temple and his presence fill every organ and cell of my being. Where God is, there is only order, beauty, and perfect functioning. His holy presence neutralizes everything unlike itself. He kept this up for an hour, and though in a very weakened condition, had a complete recovery. Could one take a corrosive poison, trusting the subjective power to nullify the baneful effects? I don't suggest that anyone take on such a trial. But I definitely believe that in an emergency such as this Christian scientist had, are through a mistaken situation, the sincere truth students looking loyally to God. absolute faith and conviction in the one power could actually prove St. Mark's statement, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, and come out unscathed by the experience. There are mental as well as physical poisons. The lawyers and the Pharisees are in all of us. They represent man-made laws and opinions and the belief that we are punished, being punished for our sins, that our calm is catching up upon us, 
another belief, another old word covering the uh, belief in hell or devils or things like that. Karma is simply the law of action and reaction. New beginning is a new end. The timeless, spaceless being is within you. It doesn't condemn you or punish you. It can't. Its eyes are too pure to behold iniquity. It can't not look on evil. All judgment is given to the sun. The sun is your own mind. And therefore, if you believe that you're suffering uh, because of some sins you committed in a former life or something, that is your belief. And you're making your own hell right here and now. And it's a, it's a morbid, gruesome belief. Believe in a God of love. And God shall wipe away all tears from your eyes. There shall be no more crying, no more sorrow, no more pain. For all these things are passed away. Behold, there is no more sea. No more confusion. So um, stop thinking that you have to expiate for some sins. Change. Forgive yourself. Change your thought now. And the, the deeper the deeper mind will respond. And the past is forgotten. And remember no more. We must not question God and say, it's God's will that you be sick. That's absurd. Uh, some people have a martyr complex, you know. Say, God is testing me. What nonsense. Uh, God is no respecter of persons. I perceive thou art no respecter of persons. Neither is the law. God's will is the will of life. And this life is seeking expression through you as harmony, beauty, love, peace, joy, wholeness, and perfection. God in the midst of you is guiding you now. 